All right, hello everyone. Thank you for coming and thanks to organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our work. Um, today I'm gonna to try to convince you that the physics of the magic angle is actually incredibly generic to semi-metals in the presence of a quasi-periodic potential. And this is gonna be a very different perspective on this problem than anybody else has put forth and so I'm uh, very excited to tell you about it today. Let me just first by th start by thanking the collaborators in this work, so my graduate student, uh, Yusheng Fu, as well as a postdoc, Elio Koenig at Rutgers, and he's been one of the main drivers of this work. He's in the audience here today. He also drove me here from Milan, so he's also one of the drivers of this talk, you could say. Um, Justin Wilson from Caltech, as well as Yang Zi from Boulder, and the only collaborator older than 35 is David Hughes from Princeton, and then last, uh, Sarangal Prakrishnan from the City University of New York. So the first part is gonna be on this PRL, and then the, most of the talk will be on this unpublished work that should be appearing on the archive in a couple weeks. So where we're going today, first gonna just give a brief uh, introduction to nodal semimetals, and I'll probably skip the discussion on these experiments on magic angle graphene, because Oscar just went through this very carefully. But then I'll jump into a phase diagram of quasi-periodic semimetals, starting from the most robust semimetal, which is Weyl in 3D, and by introducing a quasi periodic potential, we can drive semi-metal to metal phase transitions. And what I'm going to show you is that at this phase transition, it's actually the same thing as tuning this system to a magic angle. I'll then extend this down to lower dimensions, 2 and even 1D. And in 2D, we can make the connection to magic angle quite clear. I'll then show that the excitations become flat. And then from that, I can construct effective Hubbard models that give rise to very large effective interactions, where U over T can be on the order of 3,000, the bare value of U over T. Okay, so today I'm just thinking about nodal semimetals, and so this is something between a metal and an insulator. So just generically, we have some energy momentum, and we have bands that touch linearly at isolated points in the brilliant zone. This has been known for a very long time, as is pointed out all the way back in 1937, that you could have accidental degeneracies in band theory. And so if I'm focusing on linear touchings in dimensions greater than one, um, your excitations around this Fermi energy are gapless, so it looks like a metal, but then if you look at your density of states at that Fermi energy, it's negligible, and that actually mimics an insulator, hence the name semi-metal. Okay. And so this actually gives rise to unique power law signatures in the density of states, and then, for example, in the specific heat. This can also give rise to, for example, a power law insulator behavior in the DC conductivity in three dimensions. So, by probably the most uh, well-known example of uh, Dirac points would be in graphene. And so if you just solve tight binding electrons on the honeycomb lattice, here's the band structure energy versus momentum. If you focus on one of these linear touching points, you can just write down effective K dot P theory, which gives rise to a linear dispersion with the velocity of this Dirac cone, which is characterized by V. So this has been seen directly in ARPES. Uh, so this is the ARPES spectra, and as you, you can gate this material, which, which tunes the Fermi energy. Um, distinct from the solid state example, this has also been seen in cold atoms, because they can uh, engineer optical lattices that have a honeycomb lattice, and they can then probe the band structure by band mapping techniques, for example, putting a cloud of atoms and kicking it, transferring atoms from the lower band to the upper band due to the touching point of the band structure. More recently, there's actually dynamical measurements of the Berry curvature itself, which shows large barrier curvature near your K prime point. And so this can be, this is rather recent, and so you can directly image the barrier curvature uh, in this honeycomb optical lattice. So more recently, we now have these 3D examples, such as the discovery of sodium-3 bismuth or cadmium arsenide, which are Dirac semi-metals. And so I'm just showing you the ARPES data for sodium-3 bismuth. And these are dispersions in three different momentum directions displaying a 3D nodal band structure. So near this Dirac point, you can write down an effective alpha dot K theory. So alpha is the four by four Dirac matrices we know from high energy physics. And then even the year after that, then while semi-metals were discovered, which also show a linear touching point, which is non-degenerate away from the touching point. Okay. So the main question I want to ask in this talk is how do I take a weakly correlated semi-metal and make it strongly correlated? Okay. And I want to do this in a very universal fashion that is applicable in a wide array of systems. And we now know uh, actually, as we just learned from Oscar's talk, and we've known for a while, the twisted bilayer graphene is one way to do this, whereas you twist uh, these two bilayers at particular magic angles, the effective velocity of these Dirac cones goes to zero at the various magic angles. So there's not just one magic angle, there's a whole sequence of them, and the velocity vanishes linearly near these magic angles. Okay? 
And so this has been known now for seven, eight years, um, but no, it was really this experiment that, oh, excuse me. So the reason why this is expected to produce very large interactions is because as the velocity goes to zero, the velocity is effectively the hopping, then whatever bare U scale you had in the problem, the, the ratio of U over T should then go to infinity. So the, intuitively, this is why we think this should give strong correlations, or at least promote correlations relative to a weakly correlated starting point, which is what we know graphene is, right? Okay. So this really got, I'd say, revolutionized by the announcement in March of these apparent Mott insulating phases at half filling of these uh, Moray bands. And as Oscar really explained this quite nicely, upon doping or gating, this thing gives rise to superconductors, which may or may not be unconventional, but they do emerge out of these Mott insulating phases. Okay. So one point I'd like to really raise is that most angles in this twisted bilayer graphene system are actually not commensurate whatsoever. And as a result, that's going to produce an incommensurate potential for the Dirac nodes, right? And so the question we're going to ask is, what is the minimal model to capture this phenomenon at the single particle level? I want to write down simple Hamiltonians that I can solve concretely and understand this physics in a more general setting than just twisted bilayer graphene. And what I'm going to convince you of is that all it takes is a quasi periodic potential and nodal semi-metal band structures. Okay. So with that, let me now move on uh, to the phase diagram of quasi periodic semi-metals. So let's start with the most robust semi-metal, which is going to be a 3D while semi-metal. And the reason why it's the most robust is because we've exhausted the three poly matrices. So any additional poly matrix we add will not gap out this band structure. Let me just write down a simple lattice model. So this is hopping on a simple cubic lattice in 3D. The hopping comes with a phase and a uh, spin of a coupling. And then I'm just going to add a potential that's quasi-periodic, and I'll define this in a second. But in the absence of this potential, this band structure represents a model for an inver inversion broken while semi-metal. So if you just diagonalize this band structure by hand, you see that you get eight while cones at the time reversal invariant momenta, and linearizing about these cones, you see that the velocity, the bare level, is set by the hopping times your lattice spacing, which I've set to one. Let me now define this quasi periodic potential. So this is a 3D potential, and I'm going to now introduce, it has a strength W, and it has a three random phases, which is just shifting this potential relative to my overall lattice. These are random phases which we can average over, but they're correlated, so they're the same at every lattice site. This model would be random if these phases were random at each site, but they're not. They're incredibly correlated. You could say infinitely correlated. Then we introduce a quasi-periodic wave vector or incommensurate wave vector, and for numerical calculations, it's very advantageous to take something called a rational approximate, where you take this to be 2 pi times a ratio of Fibonacci numbers, such that as n goes to infinity, this becomes an irrational, basically, golden ratio squared, inverse golden ratio squared. And by choosing our system sizes to be given by a Fibonacci number, you tie the finite size rounding effects due to system size to the finite rational rounding because this is not truly incommensurate. Okay? So in the thermodynamic limit, this actually becomes incommensurate. And so this is a very nice uh, tool for numerical calculations, as well as some analytic calculations. So in the context of twisted bilayer graphene, you can loosely think W is playing the role of some interlayer coupling, and Q is playing the role of some twist angle, which you could, you could either vary one or the other. And so for some calculations, I'll fix Q and vary W, and vice versa. And so what are we going to look at? We're going to start by looking at the structure of eigenvalues themselves. And so we can do first the density of states, and we can use something known as the Kronal polynomial method which allows us to evaluate this on very large system sizes, such as 144 cubed in 3D can be easily done um, in a matter of maybe a couple minutes. Uh, but going to larger system sizes, you run into memory issues. So you have to, you have to worry about that. So L144 is a Fibonacci. The next one is, is too big to do in 3D. And so in the semi-metal phase, the semi-metal is going to be characterized by an E squared low energy density of states, and you can show that the coefficient here is one over the velocity cubed. So from the density of states, we can extract a velocity. Okay, there's numerous, there's another way we can do that, which I'll explain later on. And we're going to average over twisted boundary conditions that are going to reduce finite size effects in these calculations. But this last piece is not necessary, it's just a nice trick. In addition, 
We're going to use ED to look at level statistics. So this is something known as the adjacent gap ratio, which avoids an unfolding issue, which ties level stats to the density of states. This is like a local unfolding of your level spacing. We're going to be limited to much smaller systems with this because we have to use ED. And then in addition, if we expect the semi-metal phase to be stable to quasi-periodic potential, what that tells you is that the structure of the wave functions also have to be stable, OK? So if I'm just thinking I'm in a Dirac semi-metal phase, then all my wave functions are just plane wave states. That's just a delta function in k-space. So then another way, it's localizing k-space, right? So I, this, I define the inverse participation ratio in momentum space. And so this will then be an indicator if my wave functions will delocalize in k-space. All right, so it's, it's kind of like Anderson localization or, or delocalization, but in momentum space. And so the reason why this is useful is because if I'm in a ballistic plane wave phase, this is going to be constant independent of my system size, whereas if I delocalize in K space, this is going to like one over my volume. Okay? So I now compute the density of states, and this is the density of states at zero energy as a function of this W, and I fix Q to be given by the ratio of Fibonacci's, and as you can see, the density of states uh, remains semi-metallic at weak W, then it becomes metallic, back to a semi-metal, becomes metallic again. So we find two transitions as a function of W, and Anderson localization occurs at much, much larger W. Okay, if that's a worry in the back of your mind, uh, please don't worry about that, because we, we're confident that happens at a much larger scale. So if I now look at the IPR momentum space, uh, Oh, excuse me, so the two transitions. Now we move to the IPR momentum space. As you can see, where the density of states is zero, your wave functions are localized in K space. They're L independent. As the density of states gets generated, the IPR goes like the volume, and then it goes back to a semi-metal phase, localized, and then delocalizes again. So if we now look at this in energy, so this is W versus energy, and the color is my level stats. Since I've averaged over twisted boundary conditions, I've broken time reversal symmetry, and so my level stats are satisfied GUE level statistics if it's diffusive. And indeed, I see a very clear diffusive region, and this dashed line is actually a diffusive ballistic mobility edge, where this ballistic phase is my plane wave eigenstates, and since I've averaged over the twist, these are actually localized in k-space, so they satisfy Poisson level statistics in good agreement with our expectation. It's very nice to then look at this with the density of states. So this now colors the density of states on the left. And what you realize is actually we have a hard gap here. Okay, and so as I tune W, so this is rho V as a function of energy for various W. So as you tune W, you open gaps at finite energy and you form a semi-metal mini band, just like he was talking about in the previous slide, yeah? Yes, that's right. So this is two pi, the Fn minus two over Fn, or Fn is the Fibonacci. So this is fixed Q. L is equal to Fn. So Q is 2 pi Fn minus 2 over L. Oh, so it depends. So every L is good. So this L is 144. So there's like, let's see, 55 uh, periods, because that's the Fn minus 2. Yeah, but it's, it's a long wavelength at this stage. And so this is going to. Our direct nodes are separated by pi, and this is going to be internode scattering because it's large Q. Okay, I'll, I'll come to that a bit later. But okay, so these gaps open, and you get a semi-metal mini band. So you see this E squared survives, and this gap separates them uh, with a hard gap at large enough W. And what you see is that this gap tries, tries to close. It shoves all these states down to a metal, and then it opens back up. Okay. And so if you want to understand what's going on microscopically, you could think that these, these band gaps are passing through each other, and maybe the states at positive energy actually invert and become the same states at negative energy on the other side of the transition. So you can test this quantitatively by forming a projector onto the positive side of the miniband, and alternatively the negative side of the miniband. And you can then look at this object, which is going to basically take the difference of these projectors. So what does this look like? So green projects onto the positive miniband, so these states at finite energy, at positive energy, are clearly uh, projector one, whereas states at the negative miniband are going to be projector minus one, just because I have this minus sign. As you go through this transition, they all mix up. As you see, what comes out is an inverted semi-metal. In the language of Berry curvature, this means the Berry curvature of each while node changes sign as you move through this transition. So we would call this an inverted semi-metal phase. It's just like passing through the magic angle and going back to a semi-metal phase. 
Okay. So since we have these two transitions, uh, we've checked and they have the same universal properties. So let me just focus on one of them and go through this critical properties with you uh, in detail. So first, let me just look at rho of zero as a function of w. So this KPM method expands the density of states to some finite order. So this is the order, and this order acts like a finite size effect. So larger and larger expansion orders is like approaching the thermodynamic limit. And as you can see, the density of states continues to sharpen, which suggests the density of states is actually jumping from zero to a non-zero value. If you now look at this code, if you now look at the energy dependence, so here's our hard gap. Here's our semi-metal miniband, and I, this goes like E squared. There's corresponding fits over here, which allows you to extract the velocity. As you now move through the transition, these squish together and form a metallic phase at low energy. And you don't see any critical scaling regime in energy, which suggests the dynamic exponent is actually not playing a role in this transition. It's actually an interesting question that we are still sorting out. Okay. So now if you want to understand the analytic properties of the density of states, you could say, you can ask, does the density of states become non-analytic at this transition? You could assume it does not. So you could tailor expand your density of states. And this coefficient, which goes like one over V cubed, would have to remain finite if the density of states remains analytic. But indeed, we see as we go to large expansion orders, this singularity is very sharp on the order of 10 to the 7, which strongly suggests within our numerical ability that this actually diverges and the velocity goes to zero at this transition. So the wild cone's velocity has gone to zero at this single particle quantum phase transition. How does it go to zero? It goes to zero in a power law fashion, which then tells you, so we can extract this exponent beta, which tells you the velocity vanishes in a non-trivial fashion. And three is given by the dimension. So this is beta over d. OK. So what have we learned so far? We've learned quasi-periodicity drives a semi-metal to metal phase transition. The density of states becomes non-analytic and jumps. And there's no critical scaling regime in energy. And kind of surprisingly, this transition coincides with the delocalization of momentum space wave functions. So you can then ask yourself, can this transition survive down to lower dimensions? And so if you're thinking about disorder, which becomes more strong as you go to lower and lower dimensionality, which is this RG equation I've crossed out here, this doesn't apply to quasi-periodic systems as it's well known. For example, the aubrey andre model can have a delocalized ballistic phase in 1D, right? So we can just rewrite our model in 2D and redo this analysis. Um, and now the connection to twisted bilayer graphene is much more clear because I'm in 2D. So again, this is like my interlayer coupling. And again, this is like a twist angle. And indeed, you find another, the same type of transition, but a different universality class because you're in a different dimension. So this is W versus energy, and the color is the density of states. Here's the semi-metal phase and the hard gaps that squish down uh, your density of states. And here, rho of V scales like some coefficient times mod E. This coefficient goes like 1 over V squared. And so as a result, we find that rho prime diverges quadratically, which gives a velocity that vanishes linearly at the critical point which is exactly the same power law as magic angle graphene, which suggests these are actually the same universality class at the single particle level. And what's actually rather interesting, which is goes well beyond any continuum theory, is that this is actually an intermediate metallic phase and not a single point. And so if you linearize your Dirac cones and then you turn on this coupling between the two sheets of graphene, you're going to miss this uh, effect, which is actually rather sharp, and we have rather good numerical evidence that this is actually a phase and not a point. So there's actually two transitions between the sun metal to a metal back to a sun metal. And so you, you can actually, once you start realizing this is the same phenomenon as magic angle graphene, you can borrow the analytic methods used by McDonald, for example. And so we have done that by integrating at momentum states outside my mini zone. We've gone to fourth order and perturbation theory, and you, you look at this Gori expression, but you can then basically at fixed Q, you find that this vanishes linearly in agreement with the numerical data. If you now put this all together, so this is W versus Q, and the color is the density states at zero energy, and the dash green line is this fourth order perturbative theory, they agree remarkably well. So this is the semi-metal, here's a metallic phase, here's a metallic phase, here's a metallic phase. So if you fix Q, you can have sequences of transitions, like three, four transitions, just like you have three, four, five magic angles. So these dashed lines are just showing two different cuts. So here I'm showing in red the IPR momentum space, in blue is the density of states. 
So whenever the density of states becomes non-zero, the IPR goes to zero. So indeed, this is a delocalization of your momentum space wave functions. This is a function of Q. I have like four or five transitions. As a function of W, I have two. So I can, and I'm in 2D, so I can just directly look at my wave functions. So what do these look like? So in my semi-metal, they're just localized plane wave eigenstates. In my metallic phase, they developed this highly non-trivial structure as they've delocalized, but they haven't delocalized across the entire brilliant zone, which implies actually a rather interesting non-trivial structure. And then you go back to the semi-metal phase, which then relocalizes in K space with some satellite peaks. So you can make this quantitative by borrowing methods from Anderson localization, where you can define some sort of multifracticality of my momentum space wave functions. And so this tau m of q plays a role of this multifractal exponent, and the q dependence of this exponent tells you the nature of the wave functions. So it turns out that these plane wave functions can be characterized as something called a frozen wave function in momentum space, because this tau m vanishes at some finite q that's not zero. If it was Anderson localized, tau m would go to zero when q is equal to zero and be zero the whole way. At this, in this metallic phase, this develops a weak nonlinearity in Q, which suggests these are weakly multifractal eigenstates in momentum space. In 2D, quasi-periodicity is not strong enough to give you diffusion. So in 3D, we saw this was diffusive, random matrix theory level stats. Here in 2D, quasi-periodicity is some sense that 2D is like the marginal dimension, so it's not strong enough to give you bona fide diffusion. When you go back to the same metal, these refreeze. So you could think of this transition as some novel unfreezing transition in momentum space, which gives rise to this non-trivial structure of the wave functions at E equal to zero. Okay, so can we go down to 1D? And to do that, it's a little, you have to think for a second, because at D equal to one, you no longer have a semi metal because you have a finite density of states at the Fermi energy. So in, in 1D, what we can do is we can just take an arbitrary power law, and provided that this is less than one half, we do find that the density of states transition in 1D coincides with the delocalization of momentum space. So here's my density of states, this is the IPR momentum space, but 1D is, there's not much phase space for anything else to happen, so 1D, this is the real space IPR, 1D just localizes. And so it goes from a semi-metal to an Anderson insulator with a finite density of states. Okay. And rather surprisingly, we have a very generic result that the velocity vanishes like beta over D, but for an arbitrary power law, you have to generalize your effective dimensionality based on the scaling dimension, which you can do rather concretely, what we find is that beta is effectively two for a wide class of models. We've looked at three different 2D models that are, have uh, Dirac points, as well as this 3D while problem, as well as this 1D model. And there's a rather remarkable universality associated with these transitions, where D just dictates the, the ratio of this exponent. Okay, so what are the implications of this non-analytic density of states? I've suggested that the velocity goes to zero, but let's see this explicitly. Does this really give you flat bands? And so to test for this, since we don't have translational symmetry, we're gonna take our boundary conditions, we're gonna twist them, let's say in the x direction, via a twist, and we're gonna look at how our low energy eigenstates disperse as a function of the twist. Okay, so now I'm sitting in the semi-metal phase. So I have a little semi-metal mini band, goes like mod E, and indeed, this is energy eigenvalues as a function of the twist. I have Dirac nodes of the time reversal invariant momenta, which sat as well described by my twist dispersion. I now go into my metallic phase where the density states is generated, and indeed the bands are incredibly flat. So just look at the bandwidth, changes by an order of magnitude, and if I just draw a Fermi energy at equal to zero, my bands are incredibly flat. If I go back to the semi-metal phase, they go back to being linear with Dirac cones at the time reversal invariant momenta. Okay, so with that I can summarize that this transition survives in 1D, 2D, and 3D, and it generates flat bands in the metallic phase. Let me just do a direct comparison to theory on twisted bilayer graphene. So this has been computed by Castaneda's group, and here's the density of states. The red lines are the untwisted density of states, which is linear. You see it opens up gaps with a semi-metal mini band, and at the magic angle you produce a large density of states of the Fermi energy. Here's our simple model. We have a linear density of states. We open up gaps that are hard. We have a semi-metal mini band. At our critical phase, or sorry, at the metallic phase, we generate a large density of states near the Fermi energy. And we can just put everything side by side. So here's dispersions. Here's the corresponding density of states with the vanishing velocity. Here's our twist dispersions. You can see these things look basically the same. So this leads us to argue that this is the same phenomenon 
And we are basically arguing then that models for twisted bilayer graphene at the magic angle are actually sitting at a single particle quantum phase transition. It's a universal phenomenon. Second of all, this opens up this phenomenon for a wide class of experimental systems because Dirac points and quasi periodic potentials can be emulated in cold atoms and trapped ions quite naturally. So trapped ions is this power law hopping model in 1D I discussed. And in 2D, I already mentioned that you can do uh, honeycomb optical lattices. You can also do pi flux models with cold atoms in 2D. So by realizing how generic this phenomenon is, allows us to generalize it to a wide class of systems. Okay. So this brings me to the last part of the talk where I want to convince you that I can construct effective Hubbard models and this actually gives rise to very strongly correlated systems. Like I haven't actually shown that, I've just shown the velocity goes to zero, right? Because U also changes as you do this, the 1A functions become spread out, so U also could decrease, so you have to be cautious. So let me, the, what do we want to do? We want to, like I just said, we want to determine the renormalized interactions due to passing through this semi-metal metal transition by varying the quasi-periodic potential. So I'm going to add an on-site Hubbard U to my model, and now I'm going to, the goal now is to take translationally invariant Hubbard models by focusing on commensurate models where all the quasi-periodic systems I just told you about are like a supercell, okay? So I imagine you tiling my whole space with supercells that have quasi-periodic potentials inside them. Let's make that a little bit more clear. So I take a Q that has this ratio and I can just multiply it by some arbitrary integer and now I take my full system size to be this, right? But the supercell is just this ratio, right? So my supercell is gonna be what I was just doing but I now have a full system and I have a continuum of momenta in this reduced brilliant zone. Okay, so let me just give you some intuition behind this physics. So let me just start in the supercell before I zoom out to the full lattice. So I'm focusing on one supercell of size 144 squared. So uh, why are these hard gaps opening? We can understand that quite clearly back to Alini's question. So we have a large Q scattering. Q is close to pi. And the Dirac nodes are separated by, this is like 0, 0, and this is like pi 0. So these have opposite chirality. So as a result, this side of the cone and this side of the cone have the same spin. They can mix and they can gap out the spectrum. So what that would then tell me is that this, the states that lie within this gap have to be part of a mini brilliant zone of size pi minus q by pi minus q, just because that's the size of what's left over after this, this internode scattering process. How do I check that? Well, I can just do counting. I have two spins, I have four cones. This is the size of my new brilliant zone relative to the unit in momentum space, and I get a analytic result which agrees remarkably well with just integrating the numerical data of the density of states. So indeed, this is basically just dictated by internode scattering, that's why I'm opening these gaps perturbatively. So now let me zoom out to a full system where I'm now tiling my system with these supercells. And I'm gonna now do basically a 1A construction, again following uh, Marzari and Vanderbilt. So the idea now is we're working with exact eigenstates, so we can just form our projector onto this mini band, and by projecting the position operator onto this mini band and simultaneously diagonalizing X and Y, which is a non-trivial thing to do, you can then find your 1A states, which are the eigenfunctions, eigenfunctions, because uh, this, this, these matrices will have very small off-diagonal elements that you're trying to minimize to be zero numerically, and the eigenvalues are my 1A centers. And now I'm considering a full system to, with some big supercell. Actually, I'm gonna start with a small supercell uh, to explain what's going on. And so let me now think about this in the full system. So I've taken now a rather large value of M. This is energy versus W. So this is like the spectra, it's another way, it's not, we're not looking at the density of states now, we're looking at the direct spectra, and these are hard gaps. The fact that I have hard gaps allows me to define this projector in a well-defined manner, and then I can then compute the 1A functions, and so you see the 1A centers land precisely where the LDOS, which I've integrated over my mini band, is bright. So the brightest points of the LDOS is exactly where my 1A centers land. If I look at one 1A function, it's exponentially localized to these new lattice sites, so I've indeed found exponentially localized 1A states, which is provided because I have these gaps. So following the Mazzari construction, I can definitely find exponentially localized 1A states. And then using these 1A states, we can now compute the effective model, the Hubbard model properties. Uh, but before doing that, this is, this, there's actually a finite size effect due to taking a small supercell, which is this additional band here, 
And we find is that in this gap, if I form a projector, oh, sorry, before I move on to that, this is the dispersion from this projector, and I have self-similarity. So the, the model I get back from my 1A construction is the model I started from, but with a very normalized T and U. And so that self-similarity is rather remarkable, and you can see that these three bands are completely self-similar. This is the same model we had, just shifted by a finite chemical potential, and that's an incredibly flat band at finite energy. Okay, so these bands up here have already been distorted, so they're no longer self-similar. That's an evidence of some mobility edge coming in at finite energy, which is a little bit harder to see because we don't have diffusion in 2D. Sorry, now, now we move on to this. This is going to be a finite size effect, but it's important to understand it. So for a small supercell, there's a region where there's an additional gap before the transition where you get hybridized bands. And these hybridized bands actually have three 1A centers that make up my new unit cell. But the really important thing is that this regime dramatically shrinks uh, by increasing my supercell size. So this is just basically a finite size effect by taking too small of a supercell. Let me just now present to you the last uh, piece of evidence we have. So from the 1A functions, we now want to compute model parameters that are self-similar. So I only want to focus on bands that give me back my original model with renormalized T and U. And as I go to larger and larger supercells, I can shrink this region so I only have to focus on this gap that can get all the way up to the transition. And this is actually rather dramatic. So this is U effective over T effective in units of the bare value. And these are small supercells. You get enhancements on the order of 10. But as we go to a very large supercell, you can see the enhancement becomes massive. So as I pass through this metallic quantum phase transition at the single particle sector, my Hubbard model becomes incredibly strongly correlated. So strongly correlated, it can be on the order of 3,000 times the bare value of U over T. And with that, I can conclude. So I've shown you that quasi-periodicity stabilizes the same metal to metal quantum phase transition, which can be extended down to two and even one dimension. This quasi-periodicity generates flat bands through the same phenomenon that happens in twisted bilayer graphene. And as a result, we can construct effective Hubbard models that have dramatically enhanced interactions. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>